Okay, in this segment, we will talk about the temporomandibular joint. The temporomandibular joint is a synovial joint between the glenoid fossa, also known as a mandibular fossa, of the temporal bone above and the mandibular condyle. It is unusual in that its articular surface are lined by fibro cartilage rather than the hyaline cartilage. The fibrous cartilage is less susceptible to de degeneration and has a greater repair capacity. The joint cavity is divided into upper and the lower compartments or the space by the fibrocartilaginous articular disc. Importantly, the TMJ or the temporomandibular joint is a hinge joint which can perform rotatory movement as well as gliding movement. Hence, in more specifically, it is called a modified hinge joint. At the temporomandibular joint, the possible movements are the protrusion and retrusion, and this occurs in the superior joint cavity. The depression and elevation occurs in the inferior joint cavity, and the lateral deviation, which is side-to-side -side movement, is a combined rotation of one condyle around the vertical axis and the anterior translation of the opposite condyle. The articular surface of the joint are the mandibular fossa, also known as a glenoid fossa, and the mandibular eminence, or the tubicle. The term glenoid fossa is also used in dentistry, but this confuses with the glenoid fossa of the shoulder joint. So as an anatomist, we use a mandibular fossa for the articular surface of the temporomandibular joint. Now this articular disc creates a superior and inferior cavities lined by a separate superior and inferior synovial membranes. So let's look at the articular disc in more detail. So the superior synovial membrane lines the fibrous layer of the capsule. The superior and inferior to the articular disc, so there are two different cavities, and this is prominent when the mouth is opened. Again, there's no hyaline cartilage covers the articular surface, and this is covered by the fibrocartilage. In this sagittal section of the temporomandibular joint, we can see the head of the mandible articulating with the mandibular fossa and the mandibular eminence. In between these articular surfaces, we can see the articular disc, which is this structure here. And like most synovial joint, its articular compartments are fibrocartilaginous with variable thickness. The articular disc divides into the superior and inferior joint cavities. And this can be seen when the mouth is opened, as shown in this image here, and also a CT scan here at the bottom. When the mouth is open, the head of the mandible articulates with the mandibular eminence, and this part is thicker than the mandibular fossa, and hence it can withstand a force related to biting. Now let's talk about the fibrous capsule and the ligament of the temporomandibular joint. So the, in the lower part, of the joint is surrounded by tight fibers which attach the condyle of the mandible to the disc. The upper part of the joint is surrounded by the loose fibers which attach the disc to the temporal bone. Thus the articular disc is attached separately to the temporal bone and the mandibular condyle forming what could be considered two joint capsules. These attachments stabilize the disc but allows rotation over the condyle. The longer fibers joining the condyle directly to the temporal bone may be regarded as the reinforcing. So the ligaments of the temporomandibular joints are the temporomandibular joint, sorry, the temporomandibular ligament, also known as a lateral ligament, and this prevents the lateral dislocation. A broad ligament reinforces the joint capsule laterally and is attached above the articular, di articular tubicle on the root of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. There are two extrinsic ligaments also assist the stability and with the lateral ligament 
it connects the mandible to the cranium. We have the sph sphenomandibular ligament, which is this one here, and it runs from the spine of the sphenoid to the lingula of the mandible and is a primary passive support and swing rope of the mandible. The stylomandibular ligament is a thickening of the fibrous capsule of the parotid gland and runs from the styloid process to the angle of the mandible. Now, it does not contribute significantly to the strengthening of the temporomandibular joint. Now, in regards to the nerve supply, a common principle is applied to the temporomandibular joint, which is the Hilton's Law. So, the principle that is related to the TMJ states that the nerve that supplies the muscle acting at the joint also supplies tissues of that joint and the skin over the muscles and or joint. So, let's try to apply this principle to the temporomandibular joint. So first of all, the main nerve supplies the temporomandibular joint is the trigeminal nerve. And specifically, it's the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So if we apply this principle to the mandibular joint, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve supplies the muscles of mastication acting at the temporomandibular joint and the skin over the mandible and the temporomandibular joint. So this principle applies to the innervation of the temporomandibular joint. Now the pain in the temporomandibular joint is related to, again, the trigeminal nerve, which has a common sensory ganglion. These pain can be from the maxillary region, which will involve the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, at the and also at the lower teeth or the mandibular area, with the jaw area, which is related to the cranial nerve, uh, the trigeminal, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is a mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. And the blood supply to the temporomandibular joint is by the maxillary artery and the branches of the maxillary artery. Okay, now let's move on to the pharynx. The pharynx is a muscular facial cylinder. What this means is it's made by muscles and fascia. It is a tube-like structure of the skeletal muscles and connects the oral cavity and the nasal cavity with the esophagus. The pharynx starts from the base of the skull and ends at the sixth cervical level of six cervical vertebrae when it becomes the esophagus. Now, I hope you guys can remember the C6 is an important landmark as the larynx becomes the trachea and the um, pharynx becomes the esophagus. So what would be the function of the muscles and the fascia? And as it's shown here, the muscles are made by the skeletal muscles, so its main, main function will be the movement of the particles or the food or liquid. And the fascia is providing strength, strength of the pharynx. So we've covered this number of times, but let's quickly review it again. The pharynx has three structures, which are the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. The nasopharynx is situated posterior to the nasal cavity, and the main function is respiration. Oropharynx is posterior to the oral cavity, and this part works mainly during digestion, but also uh, during respiration. The laryngopharynx is behind or posterior to the larynx. And at the nasopharynx, we have the pharyngeal tonsil, and in the oropharynx, we have the palatine tonsil, which are the first line of immune defense in our body. So if we enlarge the nasopharynx, we could see the tonsil as well as this elevated structure. Now this opening is the opening to the eustachian tube. Now this and this elevated structure covers the opening of the eustachian tube and this is called the torus tubarius. Now in children, when infection occurs, this so infection on the 
pharyngeal tonsil will lead to enlargement of this torus tuberius, and this will cause the blockage of the opening of the eustachian tube, causing um, failure in pressure equalization, and hence pain in the area. Now let's look at the oropharynx. The oropharynx has a digestive function and communicates with the oral cavity via the opening called the fauces. The oropharynx also communicates with the nasopharynx via the pharyngeal isthmus. Now the boundaries are anteriorly the posterior one-third of a tongue, which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the posterior boundary is formed by the vertebral column and superiorly the soft palate. And there are also presence of the palatine tonsil on the lateral wall of the oropharynx. Now the laryngopharynx is located posterior to the larynx and it communicates with the larynx via the laryngeal inlet. The laryngopharynx continues to as the esophagus, and as mentioned previously, the laryngopharynx is the most inferior part of the pharynx, and it becomes the esophagus at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. Now, this is a posterior view, and as we discussed before, the larynx is a musculofacial structure. Now, these structures extend from the base of the skull all the way down to the sixth cervical vertebra, and the fascia is actually named as the pharyngobasilla fascia, and the purpose of this fascia is to support the pharyngeal structure, and the main function of the musculature structure is to move the food and fluid down to the esophagus. Okay, I would like you guys to pause the clip and try to answer each part of the pharynx, as well as the opening from the main cavities to the pharynx. So these numbers 1, 2, 3 will be indicating different areas of the pharynx, and these are the openings, and number 5 is a structure that we could see a dangling part from the anterior view. So pause the video now and try to answer these questions. Okay, everyone got this correct? So we have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, and the openings to each pharyngeal areas will be the coane, fauces, and the laryngeal inlet. And we can see the posterior one-third of a tongue here, which will be indicating this is the oropharynx, and the dangling part is the uvula, or the muscular uvulae. Now this pouch or cavity here is called a piriform recess, and this is an area where the food, sometimes the food particles, can be stuck here, and we will discuss this in the later slides. Okay, so with these anatomical structures in the region, there are three structures that will control the three openings, and we call them the three flap valves of the pharynx. So the tongue will elevate and close the oropharyngeal isthmus, or the fauces, and the soft palate, or the velum, will elevate or depress, closing either the pharyngeal isthmus or the fauces, and we have the epiglottis, which will close the laryngeal inlet during swallowing. So the three flap valves of the pharynx are the tongue, soft palate, and the epiglottis. Now, the walls of the pharynx is exceptional in the elementary tract, as the internal muscles are longitudinal and the external muscles are circular. Whereas most of the elementary tract, it is composed by a a smooth muscle with the layers of longitudinal muscles are external and circular are internal. So this is another feature of the pharynx. Now the innermost layer of the pharynx is composed by the mucous layer, so it's moist. The middle layer is actually the fibromuscular, 
And the outer layer is the fibrous layer, which are this uh, spiderweb-like structure. So all these structures reinforce the strength, the, they strengthen the structural integrity of the pharynx. Now the muscular layer of the pharynx is divided to the three area, and they are circular, and we call them the constrictors. So we have the superior constrictor, the middle constrictor, and the inferior constrictor. The superior constrictor originates from the pterygomandibular raphe and the medial pterygoid plate, and it constricts the superior part of the pharynx. The middle constrictor originates from the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, sorry, the hyoid bone and the styloid ligament, and this constricts the middle part of the pharynx. And finally, the inferior part originates from the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, constricting the inferior part. And all these muscles have a common insertion point, which is the pharyngeal raphe. Now, the raphe means uh, mingling of muscles. So pharyngeal raphe is where all the superior, middle, and inferior muscles all attach together. Now, let's look at the internal muscles. As we said, the internal muscles are longitudinal, and they are the stylopharyngeus, salpingopharyngeus, and the palatopharyngeus. The stylopharyngeus is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the origin is from the styloid process, and it, it inserts into the pharyngeal wall and the thyroid cartilage. And the stylopharyngeus elevates and opens the pharynx. The salpingopharyngeus origins, originates from the lower margin of the eustachian tube and inserts into the inserts into the palatopharyngeus muscles, and this will elevate the lateral pharyngeal wall and assist opening of the auditory tube. Finally, the palatopharyngeus is originates from the soft palate and the hard palate and inserts into the pharyngeal wall and the thyroid cartilage. The palatopharyngeus will narrow the pharynx and depresses the soft palate. So with these internal muscles, the stylopharyngeus is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, whereas the salpingopharyngeus and the palatopharyngeus is supplied by the vagus nerve. So, if we summarize the innervation of the pharynx, this can be a little bit confusing. <clears throat> so let's have a look. So first, the main nerve supply of the pharynx is via the, the pharyngeal plexus. Now the plexus means the network of nerves. The pharyngeal plexus is a mixed nerve, contains both sensory and motor fiber, and it is formed by the vagus nerve, which supplies mainly motor and the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is mainly sensory. Now, the reason that I say mainly is that not all muscles follow this rule, as all muscles except the stylopharyngeus is supplied by the vagus for motor function, whereas <coughs> sorry, the, the stylopharyngeus is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So all the, the motor supply is by the vagus portion of the pharyngeal plexus, except the stylopharyngeus, which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the sensory innervation is a little bit more complicated. And depending on the region of the pharynx, the nasopharynx will be supplied by the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Oropharynx will be supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, and this is easy to remember uh, if you think of the boundary of the oropharynx. The anterior boundary of the oropharynx is the posterior one-third of a tongue. And posterior one-third of a tongue is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, so that is an easy way to remember. And the laryngopharynx is supplied by the vagus nerve. Okay, now let's see how the sophisticated mechanism of swallowing occurs in our body. And swallowing is also known as a deglutition. So we have three stages in swallowing, which are the oral stage, 
pharyngeal stage and esophageal stage. The oral stage is a voluntary process that we can control, whereas the pharyngeal and esophageal stage is autonomic. So let's watch a clip before we go into detail. And this will show the whole process of swallowing. And I want you guys to focus on the anatomical structures uh, that moves during this activity. So let's have a look. Okay, so let's have a look one more time. So the food goes in, the chewing starts, the tongue, the soft palate is depressed, closing the fauces, and then once we are ready to swallow, the tongue will move the food posterior to the oropharynx, and the velum will be elevated, closing the, uh, the communication between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. And once the food is in the oropharynx, what happens now is, before it goes into the laryngopharynx, epiglottis will de uh, depress and close the laryngeal inlet. And then the food is pushed down to the esophagus, and the peristalsis will occur, pushing the food down towards the stomach. So, let's have a look at in more detail. So, during the oral stage, Food needs to be inside the mouth first, so we need to eat. And once the food is in the mouth, the lip is closed. And the side of your mouth, which are the cheeks, pushes the food into your mouth. And very occasionally, this goes wrong, and you bite the side of your mouth, and it hurts. Occasionally, we bite our tongue, and this is quite painful as well. So the side of the mouth and your tongue controls the food, so it can be placed between your teeth and be crushed during mastication. At the same time, your food gets mixed with the saliva and become moistened. Then the tongue and the teeth all working together form and forms a bolus of food. And then your tongue starts from the front, presses the bolus of the food against the heart palate, and then the tongue is elevated, pushing the food towards the oropharynx. Now, after this stage, it is autonomic, meaning we do not have control of the movement and the autonomic nervous system takes over. And this process is done by the sensory nerves, which is located on the walls of the oropharynx. And these are uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. Now, once the food is in the oropharynx, the message goes up to the medulla oblongata of the brain, which is an important part of our brain. And at this location, there is a swallowing center or a deglutition center which controls this process. And the muscles involved in these movements are the facial muscles, which are the orbicularis oris and the buccinator. The chewing will need the muscles of mastication, which are the temporalis, the masseter, and the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. And we need the tongue to move the food, so extrinsic and intrinsic muscles will elevate and change the shape of the tongue, moving the food backwards. And the velum is also uh, plays an important role, so the palatoglossus and the palatopharyngeus will assist the movement. Now, there, during this oral stage of swallowing, there can be some issues. And these can be reduced lip closure or reduced tongue shaping and coordination and range of movements, which either cannot form the food, the bolus of food, or there will be food particles left over on the tongue or the hot palate. And also, a reduced oral sensation will delay the oral onset of the swallowing. And due to aging, it could have a prolonged oral phase. Okay, now, the food is in the oropharynx. And the now, for the food to reach the final destination, which is the stomach, a few things need to happen. We do not want the nasal regurgitation 
and we do not want the food to go into the larynx and the trachea, which will cause choking or as asphyxiation, which is depri deprived of oxygen. So we, so what we need to do is we need to stop breathing because you don't want to do <gasps> when the food into your moving the food into your trachea, which will be a disastrous. So the glottis needs to be closed. So we need to stop talking. And important information for all of us is that most common cause of choking is when people try to swallow while they are talking. So don't do that. Allow your autonomic nervous system freely perform their task which they are good at doing. So we stop breathing and the oral cavity is shut. The nasal cavity is blocked. And then what happens is your larynx goes up and the epiglottis is closed and the food is ready to go into the esophagus. So for these to occur, the tongue, the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue needs to perform its role and the tensor villi palatini, the rotor villi palatini and muscular uvulae will work to elevate the soft palate or the velum and also the middle and inferior constrictors of the pharyngeal muscles needs to constrict the food, pushing it down towards the stomach or towards the esophagus. Now during this stage, there are also few problems can occur. We could have a reduced epithelial sensation and also the reduced lingua vela seal. This is, we, we cannot control the bolus and could have a premature loss into the pharynx, meaning a bigger uh, chunk of food can go into the pharynx. There could also be reduced tongue base posterior movement, meaning it can be a risk of aspiration, and also reduced velopharyngeal closure, which will cause a nasal regurgitation. Now, often when people are highly intoxicated, the, there are velopharyngeal closure failure, which will often cause uh, food and other things coming out from your nose. So don't drink too much. Okay, now the food is finally in the laryng laryngopharynx, and this is just at the starting of the esophagus. Now the walls of the pharynx is muscular, allowing pharyngeal peristalsis, meaning the food will go down towards the esophagus. Now from here, the cranial nerve uh, 9, 10, and 12, which are the glossopharyngeal vagus, and the hypoglossal nerve sends a motor signal to the bulba muscles, which are all the muscles that are involved in the peristalsis, and it will send the food down to, towards the stomach via the esophagus. Now the test if your... Uh, cranial nerves are working well, or your autonomic control are working well, what we can do is stand on your hand and try to drink or eat. You will still find the food going down towards the stomach, but don't do it too much. It's a little bit dangerous. Now, let's quickly talk about the pockets and the cavities in our uh, pharynx, or, or the region where the pharynx is located. We have the oral vestibule, which if you can remember, it's the area between your lateral side of the teeth and your cheek. And this area, often we can we leave any, some food particles there. And we have the valliculae, or also known as the valliculae as epiglottica, valliculae epiglottica, which is this area here. And this is a depression on either side of the esophagus. And sometimes food particles can reside here. And also, as we mentioned before, we have the pariform recess or the fossa. And this is a side of the laryngeal inlet. And this area can also uh, hold some food particles and they can be stuck during swallowing. Okay, now this is another summary of the main cranial nerves that is involved in our head and neck region during swallowing and also feeling pain. So I hope you guys use this information for your study.
So that's it. And thank you very much for your attention. And I will see you guys in the prep classes. Thank you.